After that, Secretary Tommy Thompson on the Medicare drug discount program. Good afternoon. President, the Subcommittee on Human Rights and Wellness will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written and opening statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record and without objection so ordered. In the event that other members uh, uh, from the Congress uh, attend the hearings today, I ask unanimous consent that they may be permitted to serve as a member of the Subcommittee for today's hearing only and without objection so ordered. The reason we're convening today is because we're going to talk about a subject that's very, very important, uh, not only to the people of this country, but to the government of the United States. Obesity is an ever-increasing concern of everybody. Uh, we just found out recently, when we started looking into this, that 31 percent, 31 percent of adults over the age of 20 in the United States are considered obese. It's almost one out of three. In addition, the data that we found also shows that 65 percent, almost two out of three people in this country, are overweight. Now, why is that important? The reason it's important is because of the tremendous costs and burdens that it puts on the health care system. Right now, 129.6 million adults who are currently living here in the United States have an unhealthy weight level. And uh, that's an increase of 54.9 percent, almost 55 percent in the last decade alone. So we're eating ourselves into the grave. That's a terrible thing to say, but it's the truth. The health concerns related to overweight and obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol levels, diabetes, heart disease, increased probability of having a stroke, and certain types of cancer such as breast, colon, and prostate, prostate, prostate cancers not to mention, as I said, premature death. Now the federal government is classifying obesity not just a, a, a behavioral problem, but a disease as well. And HHS is uh, conducting in-depth research into the underlying causation of obesity, not discounting a genetic or predetermined basis for the disease. A study of the national costs attributed to both overweight and obesity-related services specified that medical expenses accounted for 9.1 percent of the total U.S. medical expenditures in 1998, and that reached a total dollar of amount of roughly almost $79 billion. So we're not talking about chump change here. That would equate today at, in 2002, 2003, or four to almost $95 billion. And approximately half of those costs were compensated for by funds allocated to Medicare and Medicaid. And so the government and the taxpayers have a vested interest in finding solutions to this problem. Now, uh, in, here in Indiana, and this is very interesting, my home state, according to information released by the Behavioral Risk Factors Surveillance System at CDC, over $1.6 billion is spent annually by the taxpayers of Indiana due to the health implications linked directly to obesity. And <clears throat> my colleague from California, Mr. Waxman, it's $7.7 .7 billion, which is over 10 percent of the total obesity costs in the United States. So we have a problem in Indiana. You have a bigger problem in California. Fortunately, the federal government and private organizations have created several programs to combat and bring awareness to obesity. The Division of Nutrition and Physical Activity at the CDC has developed and designed a program to help states improve their efforts to prevent obesity by promoting good, good nutrition and more physical activity. Currently, 20 states are in, involved in, in, in that program. But we need to be more involved. And the people of this country need, need to be aware uh, that obesity uh, is, is not only a burden to them, but a burden to everybody, their neighbors and every taxpayer across this country. And physical activity is really important in addition to good diet. We need to also be talking to our fast food restaurants and the people who package foods and put them in the supermarkets to make sure that they create foodstuffs that we can consume that are nutritious and taste good but aren't going to kill us. And that's one of the reasons why we're having this hearing today. To speak on these and other initiatives to prevent and combat obesity, we will hear today testimony from Dr. Ed Thompson, Chief of Public Health Practice at CDC. 
And uh, as the federal agency charged with ensuring the safe production of food and the management of federal food assistance programs, the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, is also concerned, and they have uh, uh, one of their representatives here. We have the pleasure of receiving testimony from Eric Bost, the uh, Undersecretary for Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Services at USDA. And he's going to be testifying about the current USDA outreach programs. As I said before, it's imperative that uh, the government of the United States work with the private sector to find solutions to this problem. It's growing at a very, <laughs> I don't mean to be facetious, but it's growing at a very rapid rate and we've got to do something about it. And with that, I'd like to uh, yield to a gentleman that uh, really does watch his weight and I go down to the gym and I'll see him on the workout equipment working for hours at a time and his heartbeat I think is uh, three beats per minute so I know he's in good health. Henry Waxman, the ranking member of the committee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your kind words and for holding this hearing. Uh, rising rates of obesity in the United States represent a public health crisis. Obesity causes heart disease and diabetes is associated with premature death and it's responsible for billions of dollars in health care costs. Uh, the burden of obesity will affect every corner of our society, but it will not be spread equally. Obesity harms the poor more than the well-off, threatens certain racial and ethnic groups more than others, and in any given area can be concentrated among those who have fewer opportunities to exercise and less access to nutritious food. It is a special responsibility of government to address disparities in health. And today I would like to focus on government's efforts to address especially high rates of obesity among the disadvantaged communities in our society. We all know that the food stamp program prevents malnutrition and hunger for millions of Americans each year. Food stamps also play an important role in promoting good nutrition. Each year, the federal government sends more than $150 million to the states to provide nutritional education and services that help to address obesity. In my home state of California, these funds support more than 190 programs in 4,000 low-income schools and communities. This spring, the United States Department of Agriculture proposed major changes in nutrition education funded through the food stamp program. Instead of encouraging community-wide education in schools, churches, and other settings, USDA is now asking that programs narrowly target women who are food stamp participants and applicants. I also understand the USDA is discouraging programs for foc from focusing on the nutritional needs of particular high-risk groups such as obese ind individuals with type 2 diabetes. California is objecting to USDA's proposal. According to the state's leading public health officials, the plan changes will reduce the number of Californians served by more than 80 percent will eliminate programs in churches and community centers across the state and will lead to a loss of as much as $80 million in federal funding. California's leading public health official has stated that USDA's new strategy would support, quote, inefficient approaches, end quote. He also told USDA that if enacted, the proposal would devastate the state's successful efforts to provide nutrition education to poor and minority communities. I'm pleased that Under Secretary Bost is here today to discuss these issues with the committee. It's my hope that we can have a productive conversation about how to resolve these serious concerns about USDA's proposals. I'd also like to thank all of the witnesses for coming and I look forward to their testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Congressman Waxman. Uh, We'll now hear from uh, uh, the Undersecretary for Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Services at the USDA, the Honorable Eric Bost, and also uh, the Honorable Ed Thompson, MD, MPH. What's MPH? I always thought that was miles per hour. <laughs> uh, it, it, it ought to be. It's Master of Public Health. Oh, okay, Master of Public Health. I didn't know there was a degree in that area, but it's nice to know that. He's the Chief, public health, uh, Chief of Public Health Practice Centers for D CDC, uh, the United States Department of Health and Human Services. As is our custom, would you please rise so you can be sworn in? Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth shall be God? Yes. Okay. 
We'll start with Under Secretary Bost, uh, and what I'd like uh, is because we have uh, another meeting at four o'clock. I'd like to try to hold uh, the opening statements, if possible, to five minutes. Thank you Absolutely. very much. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Congressman Waxman. It is indeed a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, for the record, I'm Eric Bost, uh, Under Secretary for Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Services at the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, I'm here today to speak about our efforts to combat the national obesity crisis. Uh, we currently administer 15 nutrition programs serving one out of every five Americans, including the food stamp program, the national school lunch program, breakfast programs, and WIC, Women's, Infants, and Children. We are also responsible for food guidance, currently the Food Guide Pyramid, and in cooperation with our colleagues at Health and Human Services, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. I have two main points in my testimony that I'd like to share with you. One, as the chairman noted, we have a serious obesity epidemic uh, that is currently existing in this country, in both adults and as well as children. And we have several initiatives uh, to combat it, but it's real important to know that we cannot do it alone. Just a couple of statistics, over 400,000 deaths a year related to poor diet and physical activity. It is right now second leading cause of preventable death after smoking and soon will surpass deaths from smoking. Uh, diabetes has increased by 49% in the last 10 years. One in three persons born in 2000 will develop diabetes if there's no change in the current uh, health habits. Our alarming trends among children in the past 20 years, the percentage of children who are overweight has doubled and the percentage of adolescents who are overweight has more than tripled. Most importantly, this may be the first generation of children not to live as long as their parents as a direct result of this issue. You talked about the costs. I do want to note one thing, $117 billion a year in 2000 in direct and indirect costs. Also, obesity as it relates to the individual. If you are overweight, it will probably take three years off of your life. Obese persons will probably take seven years off of their life. And if you are obese and smoke, you're shortening your life by probably 13 years. Why? The immediate reasons appear to be somewhat simple. Uh, we eat too much, we eat too many of the wrong things, and we get too little physical activity. Uh, it seems very simple, but in terms of addressing it, it's really not because for a couple of things. One, we have some of the best food in the entire world, the widest variety, the highest quality, the most safe and most affordable food anywhere. Also, as Americans, we love a good deal. Supersizing is just a few cents more, all-you-can-eat buffets. And last but not least, one of, the, one of the struggles that we're having is it has to be rooted in a behavior change. And as Americans, we hate to have someone to tell us what to do. Children are a very special challenge for us. Uh, kids' choices are shaped by their surroundings at home, in school, and in the wider community. Also, television and computers draw children away from sports and physical activity. In terms of some of our efforts to address this issue at USDA, which we believe is very important, uh, first of all, there is a conference in that Health and Human Services will participate with us next month to talk about the leading research regarding what we can do to address this issue. As part of our nutrition promotion and education, as a part of our WIC program, we're currently reviewing the WIC food package. Also, we have a breastfeeding promotion, and breastfeeding is directly related to children that are healthy and for whatever reason don't tend to be as obese when they grow up. Also, we have programs that are focusing on school-aged children. Our Health or U.S. initiative in coordination with Health and Human Services and also the Department of Education our Eat Smart, Play Hard campaign, which is in school, also Changing the Scene, which is nutrition education in the school, also our team nutrition program, fruits and vegetables galore, making it happen, and also one of the things that we're, we're starting is Healthier U.S. Challenge, where we will identify schools that have done an outstanding job in terms of providing healthier alternatives to children in school. Across all of our populations, we have a five-a-day uh, program in partnership with the National Cancer Institute and CDC and our food stamp nutrition education program that uh, Congressman Waxman made note of. We're currently in a review of the food guide pyramid or food guide uh, guidance and also the development and review of the dietary guidelines. Uh, just recently, June 30th of this year, the President signed the child nutrition 
bill, which was just reauthorized. It serves, right now we serve almost 29 million children are served in the National School Lunch Program. In reauthorization, in terms of working with Congress, we were able to ensure that children have improved access to school meals for eligible children by requiring direct certification through the food stamp program, streamlining the process so that all children and, and households can apply at one time, and making certification valid for the entire year. Also, the act provides funding to work with schools to establish their own health, nutrition, education, and physical activity goals and initiatives, and also it extends and expands the fresh fruit and vegetable pilots that distributed free fruits and vegetables to schools to encourage healthy alternatives to non-nutritious foods and snacks in eight schools and on three Indian reservations. Why is school so important and why are our programs so critical? The research indicates that kids who eat school lunch eat nearly twice as many vegetables, Kids who eat school breakfast eat twice as many servings of fruit. As in terms of the food that's provided in the National School Lunch Program, the total fat has been, re has been reduced from 38% to 34% over the last several years. In conclusion, government, we believe, has a critical role to play in addressing the obesity issue in this country and in promoting and moving Americans toward a healthier lifestyle. And I think that's the issue for me that I really want to stress. It's not only obesity that we're talking about, it's the issue of ensuring that people make wise and informed decisions about what they eat, how much they eat, some level of physical activity. It's also important, I believe, to realize too that we cannot do this by ourselves. We need the partnership with media, researchers, industry, teachers, administrators, and especially with parents in terms of being role models for their children. And last but not least, we need individuals to accept some level of personal responsibility to make healthy choices. Regardless of the information that we provide, regardless of the changes that we make, it still comes down to a person and a parent making an informed decision and choice for their children. And I think that's very important. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Dr. Thompson. Can you can you pull the pull the mic close and turn it on? I, I, if I, if I turned it on, it works much better. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and committee staff. I thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. I'm I am Dr. Ed Thompson, Chief of Public Health Practice at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, an agency of the Department of Health and Human Services. Today, I'll present an overview of the overweight epidemic in our nation, and identify a number of Department of Health and Human Services initiatives and programs designed to combat these epidemics in poor nutrition, physical inactivity, and obesity. If you look at the chart to, to my left and to your right, you see maps showing the percentage of the population of each state in 1994, 1999, and 2003 who were obese as measured by our behavioral risk factor surveillance system. Uh, nearly two-thirds of adults in this country are overweight or obese, with nearly 30 percent overall being obese, as you've correctly noted, Mr. Chairman. What you see there, uh, in lighter blue, that's 10 to 14 percent of the population being obese, not overweight, but obese. And lighter blue, which appears in 1994, disappears after 2001. The darker blue is 15 to 19 percent. And beginning in 1997, you see some red. Now, red means that in that state, and you see it on, the, on that chart there, you see it in 2003. It appears first several years before. That means that 20% of the adults in that state, one out of every five, are, over, are, are obese. And finally, uh, in, in 2003, we've had to introduce a new color, and that is gold. In 1999, it appears in many states. That represents, um, I'm sorry, the gold is 20% over, 20% are over, over obese. The red is the new color introduced in 2003, and that represents 25% or more of the population. One out of every four adults in those states is obese. And in 2003, as you can see, five states had one in four adults who were obese. Overweight and obesity and associated risk factors of poor diet, physical activity, and, and, and other contributing factors uh, contribute to chronic conditions such as heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and certain cancers. A recent study estimates that 4,000 adult deaths each year in the U.S. are associated with poor diet and physical inactivity. That's as many Americans as died in all of World War II. We've already begun to see the impact of the obesity epidemic on the health of young people. 
Type 2 diabetes, strongly associated with obesity, was virtually unknown in children and adults 10 years ago. Today, it accounts for almost 50% of new cases of diabetes among youth in some communities. A CDC report predicts that one in every three Americans born in 2000, that's the children now entering kindergarten, will develop diabetes during his or her lifetime. Successfully co combating the overweight epidemic in our nation requires the involvement of many sectors and levels of society. Although national initiatives can play an important role, they're not sufficient by themselves. Community-based initiatives are critical for reaching Americans where they live, work, go to school, and play. State-level programs are critical for supporting and disseminating community-based activities. DHHS is implementing a comprehensive approach to reach the American people through these various levels. CDC uses multiple approaches to address obesity and its risk factors, including funding state health departments, school-based programs, a national media campaign, and community-based programs. The Steps to a Healthier U.S. Cooperative Agreement Program is designed to promote programs that reduce the burden of chronic disease and address the associated risk factors. Steps targets diabetes, overweight, and obesity, and, and, and asthma, and addresses the associated risk factors of physical inactivity, poor nutrition, and tobacco use. CDC funds 28 health, state health departments to prevent and reduce obesity, and we fund 23 state departments of education to implement coordinated school health programs to help ensure that students receive instruction in nutrition, physical activity, and tobacco use prevention. CDC's youth media campaign called VERB, It's What You Do, is the largest national multicultural campaign designed to increase levels of physical activity among youth. After one year, the impact has been demonstrated by substantial Im improvements, including the average nine, nine to 10 year old American child in, this, in the nation after the campaign who was, who was exposed to the youth, the VERB campaign, engaged in 34% more sessions of free time physical activity when compared with children who were unaware of the VERB campaign. Two recent major initiatives tied to obesity within the Department of Health and Human Services are the Food and Drug Administration's Obesity Working Group, which will advise the agency on innovative ways to deal with the increase in obesity and identify ways to help consumers lead healthier lives, and the National Institutes of Health development of an obesity research task force to develop a strategic plan for obesity research. In October, DHHS and USDA will host the National Obesity Prevention Conference. The conference's objective is to learn from past and current research, in identifying steps we can take to prevent further increases in the prevalence and severity of obesity. We're learning a great deal about effective strategies for promoting physical activity and healthy eating. We know that no one strategy alone will be sufficient. Our chances of success will be greatest if we use multiple strategies to address numerous factors that contribute to caloric imbalance. DHHS is helping lead the national effort to combat the ep epidemic of overweight and obesity through a comprehensive, multifaceted, multi-level approach. We're committed to doing all we can to help our nation enjoy good health now and for a lifetime. We thank you for your interest in the, and for the opportunity to share information about these strategies with you, and we'll be happy to answer your questions at the appropriate time. Thank you very much, Doctor. We've been joined by the ranking member of the subcommittee, Ms. Watson. Did you have an opening statement you'd like to make, Ms. Watson? Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And I especially want to commend you because of your strong leadership on the issue of America's health and well-being time and time again. The prevalence of obesity in the United States in both adults and children is increasing at an alarming rate. Currently, about 127 million Americans are labeled overweight, and about 60 million of the population is considered obese. On top of that, about 9 million individuals are considered extremely obese. In addition, a 2004 study released by the Department of Health and Human Services Centers for Disease Control and Prevention shows that death due to poor diet and physical inactivity rose by an astounding 33% over the past decade. Several experts speculate that obesity may soon overtake tobacco as a leading preventable cause of death. Mr. Chairman, I must emphasize again that obesity in the United States has reached 
epidemic portions. The CDC has ranked obesity as the number one health threat facing America. In a larger perspective, obesity is global, not just a problem of the United States. Recent estimates are that about 300 million people worldwide are affected by obesity. Up to 20% of men and 25% of women in European countries are considered obese. According to the National Institutes of Health, overweight refers to increased body weight that is at least 10% over a recommended weight relative to the individual. These recommended weight standards are generated based on a sampling of the U.S. population or by body mass index, referred to as BMI, a calculation that assesses weight relative to height. The NIH states that all adults age 18 or older who have a BMI of 25 or greater are considered at risk for premature death and disability as a consequence of their fat to lean muscle mass ratio. Obese, commonly referred to as any individual with a BMI greater than 30. Mr. Chairman, there are two specific concerns that would, I would like to highlight, in addition to those that our witnesses will provide today. The areas are health and financial concerns regarding obesity. First, the health concerns. To name a few, overweight and obese people are at an increased risk of developing any of the following. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, stroke, hypertension, angina, gout, fatty liver disease, sleep athia, fertility complications, psychological disorders, cancer of the kidney, uh, breast, colon cancer, rectum cancer, esophagus, prostate cancer, and gallbladder. Americans with low income levels and minorities are disadvantaged in gaining treatment due to the disparities in our health care system. More attention must be directed into prevention and awareness of obesity long before related illnesses and diseases attack. In addition to the health impact of obesity, there are also great economic consequences on the United States health care system. Direct medical costs include preventative, diagnostic, and treatment services relative to obesity. Indirect costs relate to morbidity and mortality costs. There is an opportunity to reduce costs because obesity is a preventable condition. Socioeconomically, lower income groups and minorities tend to be more obese. Another economic situation that should be brought to the subcommittee's attention may have serious consequences in my state of California. In May, USDA proposed major changes to nutrition education funded through the food stamp program. This program provides major funding to state public health efforts to combat obesity. The proposed changes would dramatically restrict what states can do with the money, forcing them to abandon community-wide efforts to do targeted counseling to women with children who are on food stamps. On July 27, 2004, California strongly objected to the proposed changes. The chief public health officer wrote, for U.S. Uh, DA to reserve directions contradicts all that we know about effective strategies. California said the new proposal would result in fewer low-income people being served and undermine hunger prevention. In this framework, or if this framework becomes effective in 2006, fewer today's in-kind contributions would continue to qualify for federal financing participation. California would lose most, if not all, of its more than 80 
$1.5 million in federal matching funds. Financially, the $21.3 billion spent in 2000 on health care and lost productivity attributable to physical inactivity, obesity, and overweight, and the $1.7 million billion dollars attributable to obesity in the Medi-Cal program would continue to rise unchecked. Rather than being a partner with states, this framework would abandon them, abdicating USDA's responsibility for good nutrition, nutrition education of low-income Americas, and helping to reverse the nation's obesity epidemic. So, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the continuing testimony of today's witnesses and the positive solutions that our witnesses can provide. I yield back the balance of my time and thank you. Thank you. It's uh, nice to have you with us as usual. You look like a fashion plate. <laughs> Just step out of one of the magazines. No, stop it. <laughs> uh, did I understand you to say that there were 400,000 uh, uh, deaths that could be pre prevented uh, a year if we watched our weight? Is that yes. correct? Yes. 400,000 a year. That's correct. I hope everybody that's paying attention to this will listen. 400,000. And, and, you and said, increasing all the time. Yes. And you said it's $117 billion in direct or indirect costs? Well, that's correct. And, and that's based on 2,000 figures we got from CDC. That's based on 2,000 figures, so yes. it's probably higher now. Well, the most recent figures, if you extrapolate, would indicate it's up to $123 billion. $123 billion. Yes, that's correct. And a lot of that's paid through Medicare and Medicaid. Yes. So the taxpayers are funding a lot of that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and you said children born today, I, I'm reiterating this because I think it's very significant. You said children born today, one out of three will get diabetes? That's correct. If, if they keep eating like they're eating, that's correct. And that's preventable if they had a balanced diet and watched the caloric intake and the fat intake. That's correct, along with some level of physical activity. Right. Now, you know, you said something about sleep apnea. I, I, which one of you said that? I guess you did. I did. You did. Mm -hmm. Congressman Watson As one of the, one of the uh, causes. Well, the reason that rang a bell with me is I have to tell you a story, and this will be humorous, but it's true. Uh, when I was a boy, uh, we lived across the street from a schoolyard, and uh, we didn't have much money, so Mom fixed foods that were quick and, and fast, and she was a waitress, and she would come home and fix dinner. A lot of them had a lot of uh, caloric uh, uh, problems and fat uh, problems. And my brother, who's seven years my junior, uh, I would say at dinner, uh, I'm finished, can I go play basketball across the street? And she'd say, you eat like a bird, you're going to die. And uh, then she'd say, okay, go ahead and play. And then she, she, as I walked out the door, she'd say, look at your little brother. He was in a high chair, and she was shoveling food into him, saying, he's a good eater. He's going to be real healthy. Well, the reason I bring that up is because it's like a record playing in people's head. And my brother today has a very serious weight problem that he has to fight all the time, as well as ancillary problems, including sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I say that, because if anybody's paying attention besides the people in this room, what parents uh, teach their kids in their formative years, their very early years, does stay with them for a lifetime. And if, 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 you, if you force feed a child, like my mom did, and she was well-intentioned, a wonderful lady, then what you're doing is you're creating that record in their brain that's going to be playing over and over again that they're going to be uh, using throughout their life to, and it's going to cause them to eat more and more than they should. Now that may seem like a very simple thing to state, but I'm absolutely convinced that that's why my brother has had this weight problem throughout his life. And I think that's why I didn't because I was fortunate enough to be a little older and be able to run across the street without eating all that food and play in the schoolyard. Uh, so I just thought I'd throw that out as, 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 as an object lesson. lesson. Uh, I don't have a lot of questions, but I, I think it's extremely important, and, and I, I guess I would suggest this as a charge to the health agencies, that the education of the American people need to be increased through public service announcements, through all kinds of ways that you can think of. We need to be telling parents, don't feed your kids too much. When they're ready to quit eating, let them quit eating like they should have done with my brother. And uh, uh, also uh, teach them, you know, like you said, that vegetables and fruits are not something that you should just have as an ancillary part of the meal. 
because they don't have a lot of calories and they won't put on a lot of weight. So I, I really appreciate your being here today. You guys have a big job on your hands, especially when you look at the growth in obesity in this country. But I do appreciate your hard work. And with that, I'll yield to my colleague, Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, public health experts believe that social marketing campaigns are a critical part of the efforts to reduce obesity. These campaigns aim to change community norms about nutrition and food. Yet USDA's proposal withdraws support from virtually all social marketing efforts in favor of one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions. California's leading public health official in the Schwarzenegger administration <coughs> has said that this proposal would lead to the adoption of ineffective approaches. Uh, Mr. Bost, do you ag disagree with public health experts who say it's important to address obesity at a community level? Well, Mr. Waxman, let me, let me, put, your, uh, let me put my response in terms of your question uh, in some framework in terms of this issue of the uh, food stamp nutrition education program because I had the opportunity last week of going to California and meeting with uh, all of the, leader, the leadership there about this specific issue. In May, we issued a draft framework so that we could start the dialogue and seek public comment on what we believe we could do with the states and our partners to improve the uh, food stamp nutrition education program. We were looking at several things. One, how to organize it more effectively and more efficiently to maximize the outreach efforts and the impact it may have on low-income people, and also how could it be better coordinated and more effectively coordinated with all of the other efforts that we, we were attempting to implement. In addition to that, and with that in mind, this was not, and I repeat, not an effort about reducing funding or nutrition education or reducing access to the food stamp program or rejecting social marketing or eliminating school-based efforts. For whatever reason, uh, some, many of the folks in California took it to mean that, but it wasn't that at all. In addition to that, we had received over a thousand comments. The vast majority came from California, and they repeated many of the things that you did say. However, we did have some states who did not necessarily agree with the position that California uh, took. The point that we're interested in making is that we have X amount of dollars to reach a targeted group of people those who participate in the food stamp program, and we sent the draft framework out to receive input about how can we more efficiently and effectively address this specific target population. It was by no means to eliminate any of the things that you noted in your comments, since, not at all. Since you've sent it out and you're getting comments, does that mean you are open to hearing the criticisms that we're hearing overwhelmingly from Californians, Democrat and Republican people in the in the uh, administration in Sacramento? Yeah, absolutely, and that's why I went to California to meet with the uh, to leadership to talk about it because so many of the comments did come from California. And the thing that I would also like to leave you with is that no final decision has been made. And I left it with, Cal with the folks well, I, in California. We're continuing to discuss it. I'm happy to hear that. Let me just ask you some of the underlying philosophy that, that public health experts are raising uh, as, as you consider your proposal. The, Health experts have argued that it's better to try to change the culture of a community as they look, how they look at nutrition than, than just one-on-one -on -one counseling. As I understand it, uh, it's hard to convince an individual to buck what the rest of the community is doing. It's, it's a difficult message to sell, and they believe the most effective approach is to change the norm and improve the health of the whole community. Do you see that as a reasonable approach? Oh, absolutely. How, however, with food stamp nutrition education money, the money is specifically designated to address those people who participate in the food stamp program. And so for us to say, or for me to say, that I'm going to use that money, and it, we may just happen happenstance to address people who participate in this program, but I'm going to get everybody else, I can't do that. Congress says I can't do that. Well, the, the, stat the statute is very clear about how I can use that money. And what we're interested in doing, what we were interested in doing, was to talk with the states about how we can more efficiently and effectively address that and do it without uh, adversely affecting what California is doing. Well, that's the key, because California is trying to take a, a, a much more broad approach than going specifically to individuals because they believe, the public health experts there believe, that's the only way you're going to really be effective. And we want a program that's effective. 
USDA's proposal prioritizes nutrition education for women with children. California is concerned this priority would jeopardize funding for many specific educational programs, including, including those geared to children in the LA Unified School District and those geared to diabetics. Does the USDA believe that one size fits all approach is better than strategies designed at the community level? No, absolutely, and the framework didn't say that. In addition to that, when we look at the approximately 20. Well, I'm not arguing about what the framework says, but this, this is the, these are the questions that are being raised as to whether it fits in with that framework, and I suppose you're going to evaluate it. No. Given the scientific evidence about escalating rates of obesity in children, shouldn't USDA uh, be prioritizing children as well? Well, we have, because if you look at the number of people who participate in the National Food Stamp Program, of the 24 million, over 50 percent are children. Given the tight link between obesity and type 2 diabetes, uh, is there anything wrong with states trying to reach out to diabetics for nutrition education? No, not at all. Okay. California has said it would lose up to $80 million in federal funding because of the limitations on nutrition education that they thought USDA is proposing. Yet these limitations do not ap appear to be well justified. Uh, I think what we are asking on a bipartisan basis in the congressional delegation, what the people in California on a bipartisan basis are also asking, is that uh, you take a look at this because they feel that uh, what is being suggested would undermine California's efforts through these revisions. So I want to give you that message. You got it in California. And as you look at the revisions, uh, please, keep, please keep it in mind. I, is that fair? Absolutely, and we will do so, and we have done so. Good. Could I uh, just continue with one last question? Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, there are new USDA guidelines. Uh, guidance uh, states that the new USDA guidance states that food stamp nutrition education funds may not be used to convey, to convey negative written, visual, or verbal expressions about any specific food, beverage, or commodity. A USDA staff has the right to review educational campaigns to make sure that there is no, quote, belittlement or derogation, end quote, of such items. Can either of you explain the origin of this policy? What scientific evidence yeah. supports this policy? And how many educational campaigns have been rejected because they belittle specific foods or beverages? Uh, the one that preceded, that preceded me, and the only one that I can think of uh, was one that was using the money to talk about uh, soft drinks in a specific state, but it's also in statute. And I think you read exactly from statute. And the statute says that you cannot uh, if it's not, belittle it's very close. Or, or have derogation of a food product? If it's not, it's very close to uh -huh. that, if memory serves me correct. Well, I, I'd like to. Can you yield? Uh, sure, let me, let me just, yes. Sure. Yeah, on that very specific point, if we have a particular cola drink that we know has caffeine in it, if that is pointed out as a risk, is that considered, I don't know the definitions of belittling, what's the other word? Uh, derogation. Derogation. Yes. I don't know what the definitions are. Is there a definition in the statute? Uh, Congressman Watson, I don't know. I'll have to look at it and see. I think the issue is about uh, being able to uh, target a particular food or food group. And I think that's what the issue is, especially with public funds. Well, let me ask you this, if you can get us for the record uh, a full explanation of how this provision was developed. If it's our fault, let us know. And then a, a, a correspondence with the food industry and all examples of state educational programs that were rejected by USDA staff based on, the, on this definition. So that will allow us to know how, uh, how big a problem this is in the, in the state's efforts to deal with it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I let, let, let me, before I yield to Ms. Watson, just say that, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm one of the biggest free, a, free enterprise advocates that there is in, 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 in the Congress, I'm sure. But if we're taking uh, exception and we're making exceptions to certain companies or certain industries because we're afraid it will hurt their sales, while at the same time it's hurting the American people by creating more obesity and more health problems, then we've got our, we've got our uh, horses going backwards here. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if there's something that's, uh, that's causing a health problem uh, and it's in legislation that we can't say anything about it because we might 
hurt in some way uh, that industry, then we need to reevaluate that. I don't want to hurt any industry because I say, as I said, I believe in free enterprise. But at the same time, if if, if caffeine or if too much sugar or too much fat in a product is, is, is going to be detrimental to the American public and the taxpayers and the health of this nation, then we've got to reevaluate and start telling people, hey, if it's this kind of a sandwich or this kind of a cola that's causing a problem, then we've got to have it changed. And uh, we need to attack that problem because the growth of these pro this problem is unbelievable. Ms. Watson? I want to follow kind of in that train as well. Uh, as a teacher and uh, school psychologist and a member of the school board, first thing I did was go into our kitchens and find out what we were preparing for our youngsters to eat. We might have found a product that we felt was detrimental to their health. In describing the detriment, you have to describe the product and what's in the product. So what I would like to see is some definition of what you mean by belittling or degrading or whatever. We need to have a definition because I'm reminded of a bill that we pay. You know, California is unique. We do it first. <laughs> and we had a bill that would tax junk food. It sunset it because we could not decide what junk food really was. You know, is... Uh, caramel popcorn, junk food, or is there a nutritional value? So I don't know how we would uh, really make this work if we didn't have some definitions or some standards and uh, when we point out the problems with a particular food. So can you respond to that? Yes, uh, but uh, Congressman Watson, in, in terms of the very specific example that you gave in terms of schools, sc the foods that are reimbursable uh, have to meet the dietary guidelines and other foods that are served that are a la carte are determined by the schools. And so the schools themselves can make a determination of what they believe is appropriate or not appropriate and would not necessarily fall in our purview. But like I said, for those foods that are reimbursable under the National School Lunch Program, they have to meet certain guidelines. And so the very specific example that you gave me is not applicable in this specific instance. But maybe you can clear it up for me. If the schools determine, can they also point out a product that uh, would be injurious to someone's health? Left, would left that it. fall under your title of, or under your reference to belittling? No, it's left to the discretion of the school. The two issues, there, there are two okay forms of food that are served in schools. One, a la carte, um, that the school decides to serve, uh, actually maybe three, uh, those that are in um, the uh, vending machines and foods that are reimbursable by us. There are three categories of food. The, 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 that, those foods that are reimbursable have to meet certain guidelines that we spell out. The other two are left entirely at the discretion of the schools. Well, the reimbursable foods, can a school district say these foods, and particularly some of them, are detrimental? And would that be considered belittling? Well, that's difficult for me to answer because I don't, since I've been undersecretary, I don't think that that has ever occurred. The school has, the school I has. I said a, we do it first in yeah, California. Well, well, no, the school has the discretion whether they want to serve it or not. They, they have choices in terms of, they don't have to say it's detrimental. If they choose, if it's a reimbursable food, then they have the choice of whether they're interested in serving it or not. So they don't have to say it's detrimental because they can choose not to serve it. They can do what they want. Okay, would you write me a letter as to what the standards for belittling are detrimental, or whatever the other was. Yes, we will. So I'll have a clear understanding. Thank yes, you very much. You're quite welcome. Before we let you go, uh, it seems to me that maybe your agencies could recommend to the Congress, uh, after doing a little bit of research, uh, what we could do to better define what is a food with too much fat, too much mm. sugar, or too much something else in it. Uh, no, I'm serious. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. In, in, because, you know, we're not just talking about school foods here. 
uh, you look at the huge increase in the amount of obesity among adults and uh, the amount of a huge increase in the amount of people who are overweight that are not considered obese among adults and you consider the health risk factors connected with that and we really need to do a better job of educating uh, in, in addition to just the schools in this country uh, I mean if somebody I'm not going to name products here because I'll be shot before I get out of the building but the fact of the matter is uh, you go into a supermarket and you look at packages of various products that you want to take home and eat while you're watching a football game and the fat content is huge Agreed. but the people don't think about that because it's not they haven't been educated about that and I think that we ought to be educating them about that and we need to have some kind of a definition here in the Congress so that we can set the proper parameters on how we can, we, how your agencies can, can illuminate the issue for the American people. Right now, it sounds like to me you've got all kinds of restrictions on you, and uh, we, need to, we need to lift those restrictions so we can better educate the American people. Well, Mr. Chairman, to some extent, we're in the process of doing that. We're currently reviewing the dietary guidelines for American, both uh, USDA and Health and Human Services, and also the uh, Food Guide Pyramid is currently under, under review. To, so to some extent, uh, we're in the process of doing that. Well, manufacturers of these various products, it seems to me, also uh, ought to get the message, and uh, uh, maybe if we... Uh, eliminated some of the barriers that you have to deal with legislatively, you could probably talk to them in a little stronger way. Not that I like to see government sticking their nose into the private sector, but when you start talking about these astronomical health care costs related to obesity, you realize that something's got to be done, especially when you're talking about one out of every three kids born today are going to have diabetes if we don't do something. I just got back from Guam and Saipan not too long ago, and they don't have enough dialysis machines to take care of the population over there, American citizens who are, who, are, who are dying from diabetes. We don't need to have one out of three kids growing up in the next 25 years that have diabetes. I mean, <laughs> we won't have enough money to buy dialysis machines and keep them alive. So anything you can recommend that we can do legislatively to, to help and to educate the American people, uh, I'm sure Representative Watson and Waxman and myself would be happy to do. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Waxman wanted to submit these two letters for the record. Sure. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we'll go to our next panel now. Thank you. Our next panel consists of Ms. Allison Kreitzer. Kreitzer. She's a director of scientific nutrition policy at the Grocer Grocery Manufacturers of America. Mr. Hunt Shipman, Executive Vice President, Government Affairs and Communications for the National Food Processors Association. Mr. Morgan Downey, Executive Director of American Obesity Association. Dr. Daniel Spratt, Director of Reproductive Endocrinology, Maine Medical Center, Endocrine Society of America. And Dr. Thomas Wadden, Vice President of North American Association for the Study of Obesity. Would you please stand so you can be sworn? You swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Let me just uh, say it's uh, five after three, and uh, I think my colleagues, uh, many of them have left, and because we have adjourned for the week because of the religious holidays, uh, I'll probably be the only one here for this panel, but I can assure you the rest of the committee will be getting this information. But the reason I bring that up is that we have another meeting that I have to go to at four o'clock. So I'd like for you to limit your comments, if you would, to five minutes so we can get to the questions. Uh, Ms. Kreitzer. And thank you for the opportunity to discuss the efforts of the food and beverage industry to help combat obesity in America. My name is Allison Kretzer. I'm a registered dietitian, and I am the Director of Scientific and Nutrition Policy for the Grocery Manufacturers of America. As the leading voice of the food and beverage industry in the obesity and nutrition debate, GMA has long established a long-term commitment to arrest and reverse obesity in America and to provide consumers with the information and resources they need to establish healthy dietary habits for life. As the companies that make the foods Americans choose every day, GMA member companies recognize their role in not only offering choices that meet consumer demand for taste, quality, and convenience, but also, just as importantly, health. 
On GMA's commitment, I can assure you that I am speaking for the leadership of the industry. The CEOs on the GMA board have adopted a global strategy on food and health that states our resolve in no uncertain terms. As you know, we are supporting the efforts that Congress has undertaken to combat obesity. GMA was an original and, and enthusiastic supporter of the Congressman Womp and Udell's con Congressional Fitness Caucus. We also support passage of the Improved Nutrition and Physical Active Act, or IMPACT, introduced by Congresswoman Mary Bono. We applaud con Congress for its initiatives, but there's a great deal more that everyone, including the food industry, can do. We recognize that food is the energy input side of the healthy weight equation, and numerous efforts are underway to help consumers better understand how they can balance what they eat with what they do. For example, companies are formulating products to meet the health demands of consumers. Efforts include reformulating products to reduce calories, fat, and sugars, introducing new products with increased fiber and whole grains, and offering new choices for smaller product serving sizes. However, one of our challenges is to provide and promote products that make eating not only healthy, but enjoyable. Having introduced numerous healthy products that do not pass the consumer taste test, we know that people will not buy foods they do not enjoy. In the coming months, consumers will see many more of these products that meet their demand for both health and taste. Just as importantly, GMA has provided USDA and HHS with numerous recommendations on how to make the Dietary Guidelines for Americans and the Food Guide Pyramid relevant and useful for all consumers while also incorporating the latest science. Specifically, we have urged US, USDA to retain the shape of the pyramid, a well-recognized brand among consumers. However, to increase its utility, we have recommended that USDA link both the size and number of servings to the Nutrition Facts Panel, which is based on 2,000 calorie diet. While a single image of the pyramid cannot educate consumers about all aspects of the government's dietary recommendations, it can, when used on food labels and elsewhere, serve as a reminder of what a healthy diet looks like. However, the Nutrition Facts Panel is not always well understood tool among consumers. For that reason, GMA and its member companies are funding research regarding consumer perception about calories and serving sizes on the Nutrition Facts panel. The goal is not just to educate consumers, but to improve the labels to meet their needs. In addition to offering new products and improved nutrition information, GMA and many of our member companies founded the American Council for Fitness and Nutrition to promote the critical balance between nutrition and physical activity for a healthy lifestyle. Now representing 91 companies and organization, the Council's work is guided by an advisory board of 27 experts in the fields of nutrition, physical activity, and behavior change. This year, the Council launched two pilot programs targeting the specific needs of the Hispanic and African American populations which are disproportionately impacted by obesity and related diseases. One of this subcommittee's members, Congressman Cummings, was at the launch of the Council's Summer Fund Food and Fitness Program in Baltimore and is familiar with its goals and the children's achievements. Both programs incorporated healthy eating and cooking segments and an emphasis on making physical activity a daily habit. In conclusion, with the intense public focus on obesity, health, and nutrition, we have an unprecedented opportunity to combat obesity and to improve public health through improved nutrition information and product innovation. We can give consumers the tools they need to build healthy diets and to maintain a healthy weight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shipman.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am Hunt Shipman, Executive Vice President of Government Affairs and Communications for the National Food Processors Association located here in Washington. NFPA is the voice of the $500 billion food processing industry and our three scientific centers, our scientists and professional staff represent food industry interests on government and regulatory affairs and provide research, technical services, education, communications and crisis management support for our U.S. and international members. Obesity is a multifaceted issue and requires a multidisciplined approach. I'd like to briefly discuss efforts now underway that we believe can be successful in helping to combat obesity. The food industry has a long history of providing consumers with safe, affordable, and nutritious foods that meet their expectations for taste, value, and convenience. Innovation and reformulation are key tenets for our industry. Food companies have responded to consumer demand by creating a variety of reduced, low, and non-fat food products, reduced and low calorie foods, and foods modified for specific dietary and medical needs. Such foods help ensure that all consumers can find products they need to create their own healthful diet. An important fact to remember is that the greatest source of nutrition information for most consumers is the Nutrition Facts Panel found on the food they purchase every day. The Nutrition Facts Panel was developed and designed to help make consumers aware of the various nutritional components in foods, and it also can be an excellent weight management tool. NFPA is now preparing a consumer-friendly brochure on following food labels for healthy weight management, featuring easy-to-understand information on food labels and how labels can help them attain or maintain a healthy weight by making wise food choices. This consumer information will be on NFPA's website where it can be downloaded by consumers and health experts or anyone who communicates to consumers about how to better understand food labels. Because of the importance of physical activity in combating obesity, the food industry sponsors a number of programs designed to encourage children's physical activity and nutrition education, such as the University of North Carolina's Get Kids in Action program, and Triple Play, the Boys and Girls Club of America's new health and wellness, ini wellness initiative to promote healthy lifestyles. As Ms. Kretzer noted, the food industry has also endorsed legislation designed to provide more government support for school physical activity programs, such as the Impact Bill. We believe that federal support for in-school physical activity programs is important to the success of such ep efforts. And the food industry has actively participated in numerous conferences and other public events to discuss various approaches to combating obesity. As I noted at the beginning of our remarks, obesity is a multifaceted issue and no one approach or activity will solve this situation. Clearly, labeling alone will not bring about the behavioral changes needed to reduce obesity in this country. We need to ensure that the information we provide to consumers is linked to both motivational and actionable education messages so that consumers will use nutrition information to create healthful diets. Such messages need to be thoroughly researched and consumer tested. In 2004, both USDA and HHS have been active participants in the process of reviewing the dietary guidelines for Americans as well as the food guide pyramid. Revised versions of both the dietary guidelines and the pyramid are scheduled to be released in early 2005. Throughout the review process for the dietary guidelines and pyramid, NFPA has strongly advocated that these nutrition education tools must be easily understood and must trigger the behavioral change by the public. Attention to positive dietary guidance messages coupled with consumer research to evaluate their effectiveness in motivating behavioral change is essential. Federally funded biomedical and behavioral research related to health promotion and disease prevention is also needed. Food companies succeed by meeting consumer demand and clearly the consumer demand for both a wide variety of food products to meet varying dietary needs and the demand for more information on how to attain or maintain a healthy weight is strong. Labeling flexibility will help to create incentives for products designed to meet consumers' needs and demands. Government's role should be to ensure that labeling and claims 
that can help consumers to better understand the role that various foods can play in healthful diets is both truthful and non-misleading. In closing, stakeholders, including the food industry, government, and the medical and public health communities will have to work together. Without cooperative efforts, we will make no progress in this issue. Dedicated collaboration, energy, and resources will make a difference in the classroom, on the playground, in the home, and throughout our nation. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee. Thank you, Mr. Shipman. Uh, Mr. Downey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you for uh, convening this uh, hearing. I hope it's the first of several on this topic because it is very complicated and complex. I also would like to take this opportunity to uh, applaud um, the work of Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tommy Thompson, over his uh, tenure. Uh, he has taken on obesity as a major issue. He has led the uh, components of HHS to develop uh, comprehensive and sound plans for attacking uh, this problem. We also hail his decision in July uh, for Medicare to recognize that obesity is a disease and to open the door to um, developing appropriate uh, treatment uh, strategies uh, for treating it. In the opinion of the American Obesity Association, obesity is the most fatal, chronic, uh, uh, prevalent disease of the 21st century. No other human condition combines obesity's prevalence and prejudice, sickness and stigma, death and discrimination. We believe that the full weight of the federal government's capacities be brought to bear on the problems of obesity in the same way we have tackled other challenging health problems like cancer, heart disease, smoking, teen pregnancy, HIV AIDS, and bioterrorism. All such efforts have involved a commitment of leadership, time, and resources across a spectrum of activities, including education, research, prevention, treatment, consumer protection, and discrimination. I'd like to briefly touch on each of these areas and what the federal government uh, may be doing. On the educational front, although we've had a spate of, um, of information and features on obesity, it is still largely misunderstood in many uh, corners, and this is true in the policy area as well. One of the things that we've overlooked uh, that you saw earlier are the slides from the CDC is that while the population has doubled over 30 years, so at a BMI of 30, the population with a BMI of 40, morbidly obese, has uh, uh, tripled during that period of time, and the population with a BMI of 50 has increased some 400 percent. The problems of obesity, mortality, morbidity, um, uh, sickness, uh, health care costs, health care utilization scale up. And so those increasing levels of severe morbid obesity where people are 100 pounds or more overweight is really where a large part of the problem is. We've tended to think of this as a, a statistically small part of the population. It is not. If all of the persons in the United States with morbid obesity lived together, it would basically be the 12th largest state in the country, roughly the size of Illinois. It would encompass, as my crude estimates take it, 29 congressional districts. The population with morbid obesity, just morbid obesity alone, is over two and a half times the size of our entire Alzheimer's population. This population receives nothing in the way of research or many of the programs and policies that have been discussed to attack their problems at that level. Uh, we have important educational messages that um, we think need to be brought out. Obesity is not a behavior. Obesity is excess adipose tissue. It's a disease because it meets every rational definition of disease. It's a chronic, fatal, relapsing disease that's at least as complicated to treat as heart disease or cancer. It's a problem that is largely going to be solved by more research. And while diet and exercise are intrinsic to discussions of obesity prevention and treatment, much more is needed as the long-term effects of these interventions are poor. Obesity is a global problem arising from a combination of genetic, environmental, and behavioral factors. We don't know how to effectively prevent and treat obesity over the long term with the exception of bariatric surgery for persons with morbid obesity. If we do not drastically and quickly expand the research base of obesity, new treatments and new prevention strategies are likely to fail and it will sink the entire U.S. health care system, which simply cannot absorb millions of new cases of diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and the other conditions you've mentioned. 
simplistic assertions that obesity is easily prevented or easily remedied do a disservice to persons with obesity and inhibit the discovery of effective solutions. We believe that one of the areas that is most uh, uh, important to address is this area of research. I've provided the uh, committee with three graphs I'll briefly describe. One depicts the growth in the NIH budget since uh, 1998, roughly doubling from 13.6 billion to 28.8. And yet you'll see, although there's been a dollar increase in the obesity budget, it's basically been a straight line as the funding has increased so dramatically. Secondly, the obesity budget at NIH is far behind that of the conditions caused by obesity, such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and in comparison to some other areas like HIV AIDS um, and uh, smoking receive a very small portion of the funding. And finally, we have a graph here depicting the prevalence of various conditions and comparing that to uh, NIH levels of funding. And it's hard for us to imagine how we are going to get out of the problem without, with this insufficient attention to our research base to give us the information to get there. So for that reason, as well as some others, we're calling the, on Congress to look at establishing a National Institute of Obesity Research at NIH. We would focus and concentrate attention on the various problems such as basic research, epidemiology, genetics, neuroscience, prevention, therapeutic uh, development, economics, health policy, et cetera. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have more to say, but I see my time is out. I'd be glad to address some other areas if you'd like me to. Thank you, Mr. Downey. Uh, Dr. Spratt. Thank you. All right, Chairman, Chairman Burton, I would like to begin by thanking you for the opportunity to testify here today. I'm Director of Reproductive Endocrinology and Endocrine Research at Maine Medical Center. In my clinical practice, I deal every day with both adolescents and adults with obesity-related problems. I'm here today as chair of the Government uh, Relations Committee for the Endocrine Society. The Endocrine Society is the world's largest uh, and most active professional organization of endocrinologists representing over 12,000. Can you pull the mic a little bit closer, please? Representing, can you hear me okay? Uh, just a little bit closer, I think you, you. Representing That's good. over 12,000 members worldwide. We are dedicated to quality research, patient care, and education. I will be primarily addressing issues of research in obesity today. In the other presentations, uh, you have heard of the magnitude of the obesity problem in the United States. Our society has provided to your committee our obesity handbook that uh, provides additional details. This handbook is part of a major effort of the Endocrine Society that has been undertaken over the past two years to increase scientific and public awareness of the obesity crisis. Uh, as uh, you have noted, and other panel, panel members, the federal government has also set in motion efforts to begin to tackle the obesity problem. In addition to those measures noted before, uh, NIH Director Dr. Zarhoni has created the NIH Obesity Research Task Force. Its strategic plan for obesity research, which was released in February of this year, calls for the NIH to undertake research exploring, preventing, and treating obesity through lifestyle modification, pharmacological and surgical approaches, and research that further examines the link between obesity and its associated health conditions such as metabolic syndrome. Several important questions confront us. What is the cause of obesity? Is it genetic, cultural, environmental? Well, the truth is there may be no one cause of obesity, but rather a combination of many with different combinations in different individuals. Why are more than 65 percent of Americans overweight or obese? And even more alarming, why has childhood obesity tripled since 1970? Why are racial and ethnic minorities disproportionately affected by obesity and related ailments such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease? While we should not single out one cause or one issue for obesity, I've been asked today to update the committee on current research being conducted by those in the field of endocrinology. Well, what role can our society play in helping you address these problems? Well, as you know, endocrinologists work with hormones and metabolism. Hormones are substances that are secreted by glands that regulate body functions. For instance, the thyroid gland uh, secretes thyroid hormone, which regulates general me body metabolism. Well, researchers have recently discovered that adipose fat tissue actively secretes hormones that influence many body functions, 
and uh, that the adipose is in turn regulated by hormones from other glands. As metabolic specialists, endocrinologists are actively engaged in the study, management, and treatment of obesity and related diseases. In both the clinical and basic research setting, we evaluate the hormones that regulate appetite, metabolism, and energy balance. Endocrine researchers are attempting to determine the root causes of obesity and to find the most effective measures to prevent as well as combat this condition. One recent endeavor resulted in the discovery of the hormone leptin by Jeff Friedman at the Rockefeller Institute, and this opened a whole new dimension in the field of obesity. Leptin is a hormone produced by fat cells that travels in the bloodstream to the brain to influence appetite. It also influences body temperature, reproductive function, and the speed at which calories are burned. This important discovery established the principle that fat cells can communicate with the brain and influence metabolic, metabolic processes. Since this discovery, there have been many more discoveries demonstrating that other organs, like the pancreas and the GI tract, can produce substances that control appetite and metabolism. It's also worth noting that breakthroughs in obesity research have resulted from what we call broad-based research. This is research that is conducted without a particular clinical goal established at the onset of the research. For example, scientists at Mass General Hospital have recently evaluated thousands of genes from the C. elegans worm. Among other discoveries, they found hundreds of promising genes that may help determine how fat is stored and used in a variety of animals, including us. This new information can be used to find similar genes in humans and then assess their significance for the control of obesity. The decision to characterize this worm genome was not made with obesity in mind, but more for the general belief that deciphering its genome would have some payoff down the road. So we must continue to support broad-based research in science as some of the most important breakthroughs have been serendipitous. This basic information lays the foundation for clinical research. For instance, currently there are only two FDA-approved drugs for long-term treatment of obesity, and neither is fully effective. Clinicians routinely prescribe medication to treat the complications of obesity that have been listed here, but we only have these two pharmaceutical options to treat obesity before it results in comorbidities. Better knowledge of the physiology and pathophysiology of obesity can lead to development of more effective drugs as well as more effective nutritional, surgical, and other approaches. We as doctors and the American public as patients need better medications based on the knowledge we will gain from basic and clinical research. We believe, finally, that obesity research should be continued on three levels. First, basic research should continue to better, better understand the body's complex mechanisms of storing and utilizing energy. Second, transitional research should be uh, moving these basic discoveries into trials of clinical treatments. Our evolving knowledge will provide numerous opportunities for better diagnostic, pharmaceutical, surgical, nutritional, and behavioral approaches. Third, as these approaches are implemented, outcome or impact research should be designed and put in place to assess efficacy, as mentioned in part of the impact bill. Finally, we should pay particular attention, as um, been noted here, to the disproportionate occurrence of obesity and its related health problems in our childhood and minority populations. So I want to thank you for inviting me to testify here today and thank your committee for furthering the public discourse on this growing problem of obesity. Thank you, Dr. Spratt. Uh, Dr. Wadden. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Watson, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of NASO, the North American Association for the Study of Obesity. NASO's members include more than 1,800 scientists, practitioners, and educators who are dedicated to improving the prevention and treatment of obesity in the lives of those affected by this condition. I'm Tom Wadden, the Vice President of NASO and Professor of Psychology at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. We have heard today that the U.S. is experiencing an epidemic of obesity. What can we do to control this public health crisis that threatens the lives and well-being of so many of our citizens. NASO offers three recommendations today. First, increase the availability of treatment for people who are already obese. Second, substantially strengthen efforts to prevent the development of obesity, particularly in children. And third, double NIH funding for obesity research from its current level of $400 million. So let me briefly discuss each of these. In 2002, a landmark study supported by the NIH showed that a 15-pound weight loss 
reduced the odds of developing type 2 diabetes by more than half in overweight persons who were at risk of developing this illness. To meet their treatment goals, study participants received frequent individual counseling from dietitians and other health professionals. Remarkably, such treatment, though clearly effective, is not covered by most insurance plans today. Ironically, insurance companies pay to treat the complications of obesity, including high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease, but they do not cover obesity itself. These serious medical problems could be prevented or at least alleviated if patients could obtain help in managing their weight. NASO believes that the treatment of obesity should be reimbursed when provided by appropriately trained health professionals. NASO met this morning with officials from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We strongly urge Congress to direct CMS, in collaboration with private insurers, to develop guidelines for covering weight management services, including diet and exercise counseling, medications, and surgical interventions. We also urge Congress to assist universities as well as state departments of health in training more health professionals to provide weight management services. While we must treat obesity to prevent the development of health complications, our greater need is to prevent the development of obesity itself. As we have heard, America's children are a paramount concern. 15% of our youth are now overweight, and an additional 15% are at risk of overweight. They're just a few pounds away. And we've heard about the explosion of type 2 diabetes in pediatric clinics. NASO urges Congress to provide greater support for obesity prevention programs. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as we heard from Dr. Thompson, are playing a crucial role through their Division of Nutrition and Physical Activity, which administers the state-based nutrition and physical activity program. But only 28 states are currently supported by CDC, and of these, only five are funded at an adequate level, the basic implementation level. So those states receive 750 million to one and a half millions per year. The U.S. needs this program in all 50 states funded at adequate levels. NASO urges Congress to strengthen support for this and other CDC initiatives, including its Division of Adolescent School Health and its VERB campaign that Dr. Thompson spoke of. You know, the solution to our nation's obesity epidemic seems so simple. People need to eat less and exercise more. And yet the solution could not be more complex because so many factors influence our daily eating and activity habits, as you've already told us, Congressman Burton. Children today see 10,000 food-related commercials on TV each year. Most are for sweet or fatty foods. How do these ads influence children's eating behavior and body weight at the age of four or 14 or later at 40? I think what your brother's weight would be today if he had seen 10,000 food ads per year. How do TV and video games affect children's daily physical activity? We know it decreases it, but by how much? How does the design of a neighborhood including the need to drive to school and to shopping centers, affect weight and well-being of children and their parents. Answers to such questions are urgently needed in order to develop the most effective prevention programs. We cannot expect children to make better food and activity choices long-term until we create environments at home and at school that support better choices. Willpower is just not the answer for pediatric obesity. This past August, the NIH published its strategic plan for obesity research, as Dr. Thompson said. This document identifies short and long-term research goals to improve obesity prevention and treatment and to advance understanding of the multiple causes of this condition. As we heard, this includes groundbreaking research in genetics and neuroendocrinology that is identifying basic biological mechanisms for controlling eating, energy expenditure, and body weight. This research will further prevention and treatment efforts. NASO urges Congress to double NIH's funding for obesity research from its current level of 400 million. Mr. Downey has told you how little support there is for obesity compared to other disorders. The NIH has a comprehensive program, but it will only succeed if sufficient resources are provided, as have been provided in the fights against cancer, 
heart disease, and AIDS. Funds invested in obesity research will yield multiple benefits. As we reduce the number of Americans who are overweight and obese, we will dramatically reduce the many complications, including type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and several cancers. And as important, we will reduce the personal suffering of the millions of Americans affected by obesity. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Well, thank you, uh, doctors, ladies and gentlemen. We really appreciate uh, the testimony. I mean, it was very enlightening because I've always been of the opinion if you just ate less and exercised more, you'd stay thin. But you've convinced me uh, today that, that that's not the only solution to the problem, although I think it's a big one. Uh, You said labels help. I think it was you, Ms. Kreitzer, uh, that said that, I, I, I believe. Uh, and I think they do, but you know, most people when they're going to the store to get something for a basketball or football game where they kick their feet up and you see these advertisements on TV where some guy's overweight and he's sitting in a big chair popping all this stuff, they don't read those things. Uh, can't the food industry uh, do something to uh, educate the people through public service announcements in addition to those kinds of commercials. It just seems like to me, as the gentleman just said, doctor just said, they get, they see how many, 10,000 food commercials per year a child, and an awful lot of those are these junk food ads that lead to obesity. It seems to me, in addition to trying to find uh, 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 better uh, foods at with, with lower uh, caloric intake and fat intake and so forth, that the, the food industry could, uh, in their advertising or through public service announcements, educate the public as to what they should be eating. It would also help them in sales of the products that aren't so fattening. Is there any thought about that? In response to your question, food advertising has the potential and it will play an important role in the battle against obesity. And I can tell you there is a sea change in the type of advertising um, that is done in the food and beverage industry and that there's looking at how within advertising we can communicate healthy uh, lifestyles so that if we show a child, if a of food such as advertising um, a cookie. You show a child coming in from outdoors being physically active and then having the correct amount of a snack. We are very committed to being res advertising responsibly and portraying the correct way to use a food and how much and the amount of the food and if it is a a snack food that it isn't portrayed as replacing an entire meal well, that's inappropriate if, if all I can say is that I have I have never seen a commercial for a junk food or a fast food that said don't eat too much of this now they never they never say that they they, they, they always say you know and I don't want to get into specific well we products. have in this country a, a, a self-regulatory mechanism that is under the um, National Advertising Review Unit that KRU, which is the Children's Advertising Review Unit that has a set of principles that all of our companies adhere to in advertising to children. And they review commercials for children under the age of 12 and they, and we have a very high compliance rate if in fact they um, do not they well, have an issue with well, how a food is. It, 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 pardon, is my, um, pardon my English, but it, it apparently ain't working because you got one in three kids that are being born today, they're going to be a diabetic if we don't change things, and kids are getting fatter all the time, and uh, the, the message well, isn't getting across. I think you've heard today that it is not just one single issue such as advertising. Um, there are many multiple factors that have changed as far as our lifestyle oh. within the last 10 oh. years. Well, our lifestyle yeah. is very, I, I, very different. No, I understand that. I understand that. But that is one part of the solution, and that is to educate. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I watch uh, uh, television like everybody else, and I see uh, beer commercials where they say, and alcohol commercials, and they say, drink responsibly, you know. Uh, but with fast foods and things like that, I, I never hear them say, eat responsibly, you know, and I'm not saying that's the solution. It just seems to me that the industry, while developing foods that are better for us, that still taste good, 
that they could also do something to talk about caloric intake and fat intake. And I won't, we don't want to discuss this ad infinitum, but I just hope yeah, that we maybe do communicate. We have a great deal of information on nutrition um, on company websites, and I encourage you to look at major manufacturers' websites, all of the information okay. that they have available. I'll, I'll be happy to look at those websites, but that's not what I'm talking about. We're talking about 10,000 commercials a child sees in a year, not their website. A lot of kids are very, very good with computers, but they don't rush to the computer to look at what kind of things they should eat. They see that coming into the television when they watch a movie or watch uh, some well, kind of other thing. Well, I, I, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but I will say that parents are a tremendous role model in government as far as schools as well but parents I you teach you. how you eat i have i have two children yeah. and can they I, can I, have I, watched I, I, me I, I, for I, I, years i want to ask some other questions let me just tell you we have latchkey kids now more husbands and wives are working than ever before when i, I was a boy uh, my mom worked and my stepfather worked and my dad went to the slammer because he was a bad apple uh, but, but the fact of the matter is, today, uh, probably 60, 70 percent of the families, both parents work, and the kids come home and they spend time watching television, and the parents don't have the opportunity, as they did in the past, to, to go into these things in detail. And it seems to me, and I'm not, I'm free enterprise advocate, as I said, and I don't like to mess around with the private sector. Let me just finish. I just think that the industry would be well served. Not only to come up with new products that taste good, that can be that, that people can consume in, 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 in a way that will be safer, but also uh, uh, so that they can they can help educate the kids because the parents, in many cases, aren't there to do it. I, I have a couple of other questions I'd like to ask before my time runs out. Did you put a clock on me? Well, I'm the chairman, but you got you still want to put a clock mm -hmm. on me? I mean, because she wants to talk. Um, you said, Doctor Wadden, that uh, we ought to double the uh, the uh, the amount for research for obesity from 400 million to 800 million dollars a year. Uh, I, I, I don't disagree that that's probably a good goal. We have severe budgetary constraints right now. Is there any other way other than uh, spending another 400 or doubling the the, uh, the amount of money being spent on research to help solve these problems for things other than uh, just uh, advertising and, and caloric intake? Well, I think that we are going to have more dialogue between the private sector, industry, and academia, and government, and the public sector, because I do agree we're going to have to have multiple sources coming together to work on this problem. I think the NIH plays such an important role in terms of trying to figure out what are the causes, where are the, the most productive avenues to intervene. Uh, your, your state is ahead on things in Los Angeles. You've decided to take sugared sodas out of... Uh, vending machines, which I highly applaud, we would like to be able to say, is that a good decision? Does that, in fact, reduce obesity? So those are the kinds of grassroots movements that we could provide funding for from NIH to see if that is a good target. Is a better target to do what you're thinking about, going more after maybe television advertising aimed at children or at the food industry? So we do need money for basic research at NIH that can address these issues as well as the types of issues you raised. But the partnership has got to be with industry, with state government, as well as the federal government doing its part. Let me just ask Dr. Spratt a question real quick. You said we need uh, more drugs, more research for drugs to help combat obesity. Uh, seems like we've got a pill for everything. And, and I just wonder, it, do, 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 and you, you may be correct, I, I, I don't know. Do we really need more prescription-type drugs to, to uh, deal with the obesity problem? Well, uh, it, it, would our money be better spent in, in education uh, and, and that sort of thing, rather than after the fact giving people pills to control their appetite? Well, I personally agree with you, and I think our community would too, that, there are, um, that the knowledge that we're gaining can lead to many approaches besides just some medicines that uh, will help control obesity. However, for a subset of patients with morbid obesity, while well, nothing else is working, that's at great risk, these uh, effective medicines are of great benefit in uh, reducing the uh, problems of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So it's one part, I believe, of the solution, certainly not the whole solution. Okay. Ms. Watson, I'll yield to you. I'm, sh I'm sure my time's expired. 
This is a, uh, these are issues that we have been dealing with for decades. And I am looking at the industries that produce these foods, fast foods in particular. And in certain areas of my district, you can go into one block and you could find five or six fast foods, particularly fried chicken. And uh, we have uh, new donut shops now, nothing but oil, dough, carbohydrates. And our kids whose parents are not in the home, homes most often are dysfunctional, will have breakfast in the morning, a donut and a Pepsi, a donut and a Coke. That's their breakfast. And so what I see is a partnership. At least we have labeling now and in a lot of the restaurants. They tell you what's in the food and how it's prepared somewhat. But they are, I think, attractive nuisance. What can we do to bring the food production industry, our educational services, our health services together on this and not appear too heavy handed with it? But we're going to have to do a better job somewhere along this way of educating people. And I don't think a pill is the answer because uh, naturally our body will digest and use the fats it needs and get rid of the others. But the problem is how do our children in today's world uh, really know how to use that pyramid? I remember, you know, and I'm talking about another life when I went to school, that it was emphasized now we hardly mention it. So anyone want to speak to that? Um, yes. I think, I think we have to take... Uh, Can you turn your mic on, Mr. Downey? Uh, take drug development as, 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 as a serious tool here. We've, we've, we're accustomed to using this to control things like uh, cholesterol, to control hypertension. And if we did have an array of uh, several, five or six kinds of medications like we have for diabetes, uh, hypertension and the like, we could get a lot of these problems under control and not not have the, the higher expenses that come from leaving it uh, untreated. So I look at this as, uh, as just kind of, a, it's another chronic disease. Um, uh, drug, drug medications are a common way that we, we approach these. I think, it, and, and while the, the environmental activities, uh, areas like you've touched on are uh, extremely interesting, um, and, and we have around the world really kind of natural experiments going on of countries that have, are changing from uh, one kind of uh, lifestyle more to a Western lifestyle. Maybe they don't have television advertising. Maybe they don't have vending machines. We really don't know what's happening there in terms of whether those are influencers, controllers on obesity or not. I will mention about, uh, since you raised it, about uh, the fast food franchises in uh, particularly low-income minority areas. Um, I, I don't have the figures in front of me, but I was, uh, uh, came across information a few years ago that um, for the Small Business Association, uh, if Small Business Administration, uh, this is a major part of their whole economic development program in many minority uh, areas. And so uh, my, uh, the article I read indicated that uh, this is the, what the SBA was largely doing with its minority economic development program was supporting uh, these franchises in these economically depressed communities that provided a lot of jobs and income. And so the, 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 the issues become a lot uh, tougher to tease out. And while we talk about food advertising, uh, we also have a situation that uh, Congress, um, as, as is true in virtually every Western democracy, um, heavily subsidizes the agricultural industry we produce twice as many calories per person per day as we need in this country. Um, this creates great demands. We can increase portion sizes without really taking in the cost of food very much. It puts a premium on advertising and marketing uh, to get market share, um, et, et cetera. So the, the frustrations, I know Dr. Wadden and I have talked about these a lot, and he's an expert in these. These are trade-offs. Uh, these things were developed uh, to create obesity, but our whole society is really geared 
to um, reducing physical activity. Uh, we've engineered physical activity out of our time. We're trying to increase productivity. Uh, so American workers are now working longer, harder, more productively than ever before. We're using technology where we didn't uh, just five or 10 uh, years ago. And, uh, and they, these are all creating this environment or lifestyle. It's very hard for an individual to, to change that. That's the environment that we are all in. Well, we sit here and we talk about the problem and I kind of hear an acceptance of the problem. I am hoping from you to hear more about how we then resolve these problems for the future. Uh, you know, the free market is going to continue to produce its goods as long as they are uh, meeting a profit. However, uh, we worry about the physical health of uh, Americans and what we can do and what policies we can set. And I do hope that we can hear back from you as to how we can guide, how you can help us guide policy that would improve the health of Americans. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Uh, well, let me just say uh, you've been a very uh, interesting panel. Uh, I really appreciate the illumination of a lot of the issues that I wasn't familiar with. Uh, I, one thing that I noticed, Mr. Shipman, I didn't ask you a question, but uh, you and uh, the young lady next to you there, Ms. Kreitzer, is it Kreitzer? Kreitzer? Kreitzer. Kreitzer, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, I think one of you indicated that uh, the Food Processors Association produces about $500 billion a year in product, and so it's a very, very large industry in this country. Uh, I don't know how much of that uh, they utilize uh, for advertising uh, or for public service announcements, but I'd just like to suggest that maybe in the process of developing new and better foods that will help solve this problem, that they might be able to do some advertising which will help in that direction and use just a few of those dollars to educate the public uh, uh, so that uh, we can maybe enlist their help to, to solve the problem. Government can't do it all. I mean, gentlemen over there, Dr. Wadden asked for $400 million more. We've got a huge budget deficit right now. We've got a war we're fighting in Iraq. We've got a war against terrorism. We have to increase our intelligence uh, activities, CIA and FBI. I mean, to protect the American people against uh, uh, an attack by terrorism, terrorists. And so we don't have the luxury of being able to put an extra four or $500 million here, or $5 billion there, or whatever it happens to be. But the industry that produces these products and does, in a way, contribute to the problem, could be a big help to us by educating the public through their advertising and through public services announcements, as well as coming up with new products that taste good. I'd love to sit down and watch a football game where I could eat to my heart's content and not get fat. Right now, I can't do that. But if you guys come up with something, I'll buy that product day and night. And with that, thank you very much for being here. We really, really appreciate it. We stand adjourned. We'll have another hearing on this in the future. Next, Secretary Tommy Thompson on the Medicare Drug Discount Program. That's followed by a State Department briefing on international religious freedom, led by Secretary Colin Powell.